On my layout, I use dwarf signals to control traffic onto the main line. In this video, I'll show you how I build my dwarf signals and how I control them automatically for about $5 per signal. Welcome back to my channel, and as always, thanks to my subscribers. Here are the components I use to build my dwarf signals. The signal heads, LEDs, and resistors come as a set containing head 10 heads, 10 red LEDs, 10 green LEDs, and 10 resistors. The set costs about $10. In addition, you'll need some 1 quarter inch styrene channel and some 20 thousandths by 1 quarter inch styrene strip. If you want to add some detail to the back side of the signal, you'll need some 5 thousandths styrene sheet and some 10 thousandths styrene rod. You'll need some hookup wire. I use 30 gauge wire in red, green, and black. Finally, you'll need two resistors per signal, not one. You may find, as I did, that the resistors supplied with the signal kit are not adequate. The kit includes 1600 ohm resistors. I ended up using 3300 ohm resistors on the red LEDs and 5100 ohm resistors on the green LEDs. Before I describe construction of the signals, I'd like to present some background information on LEDs in order to define some terminology. An LED has two connections, an anode and a cathode. The anode is almost always the longer of the two leads, and it must be connected to positive voltage. The cathode is the shorter lead, and it must be connected to ground. Most LEDs can tolerate, at most, 2 or 3 volts. If you apply more voltage without a current limiting resistor, the LED will burn out so quickly you may not even notice a flash of light. If you connect the voltage backward, the LED simply will not light. When we connect LEDs in parallel, as in railroad signals, we can choose to wire all the anodes together, thus creating a common anode device. We would then connect the common anode to positive voltage and connect the individual cathodes through a switch to ground. Alternately, we can connect all the cathodes together, creating a common cathode device. In that case, we would connect the common cathode to ground and connect the individual anodes to positive voltage, again using a switch. The commercial signals you buy will be listed as either common anode or common cathode. Either style will work just fine, but they have to be connected to power differently. This is a bicolor LED. It contains two LEDs connected in parallel, and it has three leads. One common lead in the center, a lead for one color on one side, and a second lead for the second color on the opposite side. This particular bicolor LED is a red-green LED with a common cathode. Therefore, we must connect the common lead, the cathode, to ground, and then connect the individual color anodes to positive voltage. The color depends on which anode is powered. In this video, I'll show you how I build my dwarf signals using common anode wiring. Later on, I'll show you how to build a controller which will control either common anode or common cathode devices. First, I solder the connecting wires to the two LEDs. Locate the anodes, the longer leads, remember, and clip these leads off the LED, leaving about one millimeter of lead for a solder point. Solder a short length, say about six inches, of black wire to each lead, then solder the free ends of those two black wires together. Next, clip the cathode leads, leaving about a millimeter, and solder a short length of red wire to the red LED, and a short length of green wire to the green LED. Be sure to test your LEDs after every solder connection. You do not want to wind up with a completed and painted signal, only to discover that there is an electrical issue. Now insert the LEDs into the signal head as far as possible and fix them in place using superglue. I also apply some thick superglue on the four soldered LED connections for protection against shorts. 
Next, I cut a piece of one quarter inch channel to length and glue it to the back of the signal head, allowing the wires to extend out the bottom. Then I cut a piece of 20 thousandths by one quarter inch styrene to length and glue it to the top of the signal. This covers the gap between the signal head and the channel and creates the top of the signal cabinet. I like to add some extra detail to the back of the cabinet to give it a more finished look. A rectangle of 5 thousandths styrene sheet forms the access door. Short lengths of 10 thousandths rod form the hinges and a tiny rectangle of 20 thousandths sheet forms a door handle. Now it's time to paint. I mask off the front face of the signal and prime and paint the other three sides and the top an aluminum color. When the paint is cured, remove the masking tape and touch up the front face with flat black paint. Also paint the exposed sides of the LEDs flat black. I apply an identification number to the cabinet door. My HO scale maintenance workers need a light way to be sure they are working on the correct signal, and this is the number they will refer to. I prefix the number with the letters CA to remind me that this is a common anode device. I use the prefix CC for common cathode devices. You can apply the identification number using dry transfer letters from Woodland Scenics, but I find it a lot easier to create custom decals. Just print, seal, cut, and apply like any decal. When finished, apply a light spray of doll coat over the entire signal. Now that our dwarf signals have been built, it's time to create the circuitry to control the signals. This control circuit will use one set of auxiliary contacts provided by most switch machines. When the turnout is in the straight position, one LED is illuminated, and when the turnout is in the diverging position, the other LED is illuminated. Here is a schematic of the complete circuit. The signal provides this portion of the circuit, and the switch machine provides this portion of the circuit. We'll use screw terminals to make it easier to connect the three components. Positive voltage is applied to the common anode, and individual resistors are provided on each cathode. This allows us to select an appropriate resistance for each of the LEDs. In general, the green LED will be much brighter and will require a higher resistance. The two cathodes are connected to the switch machine and the common switch machine terminal is connected to ground. This circuit will work for any common anode device with two LEDs, but it won't work for a common cathode device. If the LEDs are flipped so the cathodes are at the top of the schematic, you can see that no current will flow. Therefore, I add a DP-DT switch to reverse the polarity of the current to the device. In one position, it connects the common LED leads to the ground, and it connects the switch machine common to positive voltage. In the other position, the switch provides positive voltage to the common LED leads and connects the common switch machine to ground. This single circuit will control common anode devices or common cathode devices simply by setting the DPDT switch in the appropriate position. With the circuit designed, it's time to build the prototype circuit board. To build the prototype board, you'll need a 4 by 6 centimeter prototype PCB board, one 2-pin screw terminal connector, two 3-pin terminal connectors, one DPDT switch, two resistors, and a supply of solid 28-gauge hookup wire. Stranded wire should be avoided. Any stray wire strands can cause shorts, which are nearly impossible to find and fix. Start by inserting the components into the board, as shown here, and soldering them into position. Then solder the following 12 connections, using solid 28 gauge wire. Connect the plus 12 volt pin to the DPDT pin at lower left. Connect the ground to the DPDT pin at the upper left. Connect the center bottom DPDT pin to the common LED pin. Connect the center top 
DPDT's pin to the switch machine common pin. Connect the 12 volt DC pin to the upper right DPDT pin. Connect the ground to the lower right DPDT pin. Connect R1 to the green LED pin. Connect switch machine pin 1 to R1. Connect R2 to the red LED pin. Connect the switch machine pin 2 to R2. Now it's time to test the prototype circuit. Connect 12 volts DC, positive and ground, to the two pin power connector as shown. Next, connect your signal to the three signal pins. Black wire to common, green wire to the center terminal, and red wire to the end terminal. Finally, insert a jumper wire into the common switch machine terminal. We'll use the other end of this wire to simulate the switch machine contacts. When we turn on the DC power, the signal will be dark. Touching the jumper wire to the center terminal of the switch machine will light the green LED, and touching the jumper wire to the end terminal will light the red LED. If nothing lights, the DPDT switch is in the wrong position. Flip the switch and try again. The LEDs should light this time. Mark the correct switch position as common anode, and mark the other position as common cathode. I tested my board with this common cathode signal I had on hand. As you can see, the board works just fine for both common cathode and common anode devices. If you only have one dwarf signal on your layout, you're done. But most of us have considerably more than one such signal, so we need just as many boards as we have signals. This is where custom printed circuit boards can save a huge amount of time. You probably noticed that the most tedious part of assembling the prototype board was soldering all the wires in position. A custom printed circuit board eliminates the need for installing those wires. The traces printed on the front and back of the PCB replace the connecting wires. It's fairly easy to design your own printed circuit board using the Fritzing software. Even though I was a brand new user, I designed this PCB in a few hours. This board is 3.3 by 4.4 centimeters, a little smaller than the prototype board, which was 4 by 6 centimeters. Once the board design is complete, you can export the file for production and upload it to a custom board printing service. I use JLC PCB. They will print five boards for $2 or 15 boards for $4. Standard shipping is $18 for two to four day delivery, but you can select a slower delivery service for under $2. Once you have the custom board, Simply solder the components, the three screw terminals, the DPDT switch, and the resistors, to the board. Hook up the signal device and power, and connect it to your switch machine. You can take this control concept even farther. Some modelers install two dwarf signals facing the turnout points. One signal is always green, and the other signal is always red. Which signal is green depends on the turnout position. This provides an easy way for an approaching train to determine the turnout position. Alternately, one might use two bicolor LEDs in one dwarf signal. A green over red ads aspect would indicate a straight route, while a red over green aspect would indicate a diverging route. This type of signal would have five connections, a common connection, two red connections, and two green connections. I have included a link to this two dwarf signal controller PCB design, which will work for either of these scenarios. Simple circuit boards like these are an excellent way to connect various electrical components on your model railroad. I hope I have demonstrated how easy it is to design and build these circuit boards. 
In the description below this video, you'll find links to many of the products and tools I've mentioned. I love to read your comments and to respond to your questions. If you want to see more videos of this type, be sure to subscribe and hit the like button. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.